Urban Lake. Welcome to the Distinguished Lecture Series. We're very pleased to have um, Judith Pearl. Judith Pearl is a professor at UCLA who's been working for many years in um, artificial intelligence and computer science. She's written hundreds of papers, has three main books, one's on heuristics, and I'm told there's a whole subfield of AI that's still working on Chapter 5 of this book. So it's um, famous. Um, still lots of things changed the subgroup of AI. The second book was on the problems of reasoning and sort of changed the fall of AI and machine learning. Now people now, when it came out, people were suspicious of probability and now everyone uses probability, particularly graphical models, which is arguably invented. His third book was on heuristics and hope and his planning for his in the midst of changing sort of science and statistics and everywhere else, but now people are happy to talk about talk about um, causality. So he was the um, winner of many awards. In particular, he's won the the, the Turing Award, which is an auspicious year because it's the centenary of our Turing's birth, um, and he, and it's sort of the Nobel Prize in computer science in regard to that. And it was for fundamental contributions to artificial intelligence to the development of calculus and problems that can cause reasoning. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction and thank you for being here. I hope I can live up to the expectation that you were set up. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about the mathematics of cause and effect in the context of Turing test, because it is the centennial of uh, Alan Turing, Turing, and because it fits so nicely into his conception of what intelligence is and what artificial intelligence is. So I will start with uh, just directly here into the. Oh, this is good, good, good. Okay. <clears throat> I'll give you an um, overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'll go from Turing test to Bayesian network. I had some flirtation with Bayesian network in the 1980s. From Bayesian network to do calculus, to the calculus of doing in that case, with which I flirted with. <laughs> I had a flirtation in the 1980s and 90s, and then Currently, we have the task of going from messy science to counterfactuals. And here are little four triumphs or victories of the calculus of counterfactuals. What is to do with the policy evaluation? Everybody wants to know about it. Then attribution, how can you attribute the cause to a particular event and not another? Mediation, what's the difference between direct and indirect effect, and then generalizing from one experiment to another. Let's start with Turing. This is a picture of Alan Turing, and as we all know, in um, October of 1950, he published a paper that the title was very provocative, provocative at the time. Can machine think? And um, he proposed a test to uh, certify the, the conclusion that the machine thing, if the machine passes the test, we would say that machine thing. And just to give you an idea of how provocative this uh, title was in the 1950s, in February of 1950, there was a paper by Claude Shannon in Scientific American about chess playing machine, uh, in which he essentially did everything that we know today about chess playing. The minimax and the rollback and the heuristic function on the frontier, you know, everything was very enchanting. And he ended by a question. Suppose the machine plays a good game of chess. Can we say that the machine thing? And he reserved the conclusion. I'm not going to get into that philosophical question. That depends how you define thinking. He was a great mathematician, Claude Shannon, and so did Turing. But Turing took the step forward and said, yes, 
If the machine performs according to the criteria that I'm going to prescribe to you today, then we, it behooves us to, to conclude that the machine thinks and what was his test. He said, yes, if it acts like a thing, and what does it mean to act like a thing? It means it answers non-trivial questions about a story, about a topic, or a situation. So here is what Turing envisioned in terms of the test. The interrogator is <coughs> supposed to distinguish whether the uh, object behind the partition is a machine or a human being. The moment that the interrogator cannot tell the difference, then we say the machine thinks. That was Turing test. And here is the kind of scenario that Turing envisioned. Here's the first question. Please write me a sonnet on the subject of fourth page. And the machine answers, count me out of this one. I never could write poetry. <laughs> Which is, you know, I know some human being answering that way, so it's not too far fetched. The next one, add these two numbers. And the machine, of course, put them two together, but it paused for 30 seconds to make you believe that this is, the numbers are big. <laughs> At that time, by the way, it wasn't as uh, funny as it is today. <laughs> it was 1950. <laughs> and then comes the question, do you play chess? And the machine answers, yes. Okay, suppose I have a king on my k1 and no other pieces. You have only king on k6 and rook on r1. It is your move. What do you play? And the machine answer, after the pause of 15 seconds, Rook to R8, mate. So this is on page one of Turing uh, paper. Uh, it's not that simple to go much deeper than that, and deeper into the uh, paper, he makes even a quantum jump into the relationship between machine learning and evolution. The survival of the fittest is a very slow method for measuring advantages, he said. The experiment, I mean the program, by exercise of intelligence should be able to speed it up. And how? If he can trace a cause of some weakness, we can probably think of the kind of mutation, uh, he can probably think of the kind of mutation which will improve it. So if the programmer can identify the reason for weakness, then he acts like a revolutionary mutation and artificially, by reason of intelligence, overcome this weakness by a change which will improve it. So that was in 1950s already, he envisioned machine learning uh, to that depth, being, having I, I, one can extrapolate the machine having a blueprint of its own software and discovering a weakness in its software and creating a mutation for that software. That was in 1950s. So here is the experiment. Here is the interrogator, and here are two objects, and the interrogator must decide which is a machine and which is a human being. And I would like now to uh, embed causal conversation in the context of Turing test. So here is a kind that the input will be a story. The question will be of three kinds. What is, what if, and why? And the answer will be, I believe that so and so is true, and this is likely, this is not likely, and so So here is the story. You have, uh, you go out of your house and you find a pavement and it's uh, slippery, it's wet, and you suspect that the sprinkler could have turned it wet. You know that if the season is dry, then people tend to turn the sprinkler on, automatic sprinkler, and rainy season also causes rain, rain causes wetness, and so on. But everybody, the child knows that kind of scenario. Okay? So now you have a machine, you have to program a machine to fool the interrogator in answering question of what is, what if, and why. So here's the first question. If the system is dry, if the pavement is slippery, did it rain? We expect an answer like that. Unlikely. It is more likely the sprinkler was on. 
And with a very slight possibility that it's not even wet. But perhaps. You know, there was some plastic on the, on the pavement. And, um, okay, every child can answer that. And the machines today can answer that. That's just a bit. When you see the Q and A, you know, be assured that the machines today can answer this kind of question. Okay? So you don't ask me. But what if we see that the spring is at all? Then you want the machine to answer, then it is more likely that it's rain. That's reasonable, right? There should be a cause for the wetness. If it isn't sprinkler, it must be the rain. Now comes, do you mean that if we actually turn the sprinkler on, the rain will be less likely? Ah, here comes the action, right? We actually turn on the machine. And the machine has to know, and he said, no, 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 no. The likelihood of rain would remain the same, but the pavement will surely get wet. And now comes the fourth one, which is, comes to factual. Suppose we see the sprinkler is on and the pavement is wet. What if the sprinkler were off? So you're changing the, the, the universe. You're looking into a parallel universe in which everything is the same except the machine were off. And you want the machine to answer like that. The pavement will be dry because the, the season is likely dry. Otherwise, the sprinkler would not be on. Be that's, that's the kind of reasoning you want the machine to go through, and today we can do it. Aha! That's where the uh, Turing test comes in, and causal reasoning comes in. At the time <coughs> that AI picked up the Turing test as a paradigm, the driving force behind many of AI projects, there was a philosopher named Searle in Berkeley who claimed. It doesn't mean that the machine understands things, or that the machine thinks. Even if the machine can answer all the questions that you want, and, and you, you are unable to distinguish between the machine and human being, it doesn't mean the machine can think. Why? Because perhaps the machine was programmed you know, to answer all these questions. They had a long list of questions, a long list of answers, and the machine just picked up the right answer for the right question. Here, he imagine that you have the machine trying to fool the interrogator to believe that the machine knows Chinese house with a big Chinese uh, book. On one side you have a question. If you see this shape, followed by this shape, followed by this shape, they produ produce this shape. Without understanding at all what's going on behind the, um, the meaning of the shapes. Okay? Garbage in, garbage out. Ah, uh, what he, what Sarah forgot, uh, oversight is that there are not enough <coughs> molecules in the universe to make that kind of book. Because Chinese, like any natural language, is quite complicated. The number of sentences should be formed you know, for that book is enormous. The combinatorial explosion, explosion will get, get you, will fail you before you even get to the fifth chapter. So, Ah, uh, and now the question is, and you'd be surprised, even for the spring example, for which we have only a, a tiny scenario out of your house, with five variables, the combinatorial explosion will already will fail you. So just think in terms of ten variables, let's do a little calculation, ten variables, I had five, but imagine you have ten binary variables, okay? To store the probability for ten, Binary variables require 2 to the 10, um, so they require um, 10, yeah, 2 to the 10, that's uh, 1,000. It's a table of 1,000 names. Okay. Now comes the action. Every subset of variables can be an action. I do that, I do that, I do that. Okay. You have 2 to the 10 different um, subsets. So you multiply 1,000 by 1,000, you get a million. Now you have counterfactual. Assuming that you see a subset, you do a subset, figure out what's the probability of the subset. So you have already a billion, just for 10 billion. So how can we encode in this simple problem of sprinkler, and rain, and pavement, an answer to so many complicated questions about what if we do, what if we turn the sprinkler on, how can we do that? that that's the whole idea. They call beating up. It's the combinatorial explosion is a necessary component for understanding. 
actually it can be even equated to understanding. Let me summarize it here. Understanding requires that we translate the world constraint into a grammar and how it to answer queries swiftly and reliably. So parsimony is not just syntactic decoration. Parsimony can only be achieved by exploiting the constraints in the world to beat the combinatorial expression. It's a must. Now, why am I dwelling on causal conversation? And this is the purpose of the next uh, slide. If you run Turing test, on Turing test, and many people in AI are exercising it, in many domains, poetry, arithmetic, chess, stock market, medical diagnosis, and so on, and I pick causal reasoning. Why? Because one, it's the basis for human cognition and human ethics. Number two, because it's the basis for scientific thinking. And number three, it's the basis of robotics. But every robot is a baby scientist. And number four, it is because our world is full of data-intensive scientific applications that could benefit from causal reasoning, which means that every insight we get by trying to teach the robot cause-effect relationship can be translated into millions of dollars in pharmaceutical companies. And I don't want to uh, denigrate them by saying thousands of hungry and aimless customers. Yes, now many empirical scientists are looking at the world full of data, trying to make sense of it. And making sense means finding the cause-effect relationship in the process that generated the data. I can go here from a pharmaceutical company, company trying to make a drug that is effective. And I can talk about economists trying to decide to raise or lower taxes. I can go in again and again. And I call them aimless customers because there hasn't been any mathematics yet to guide the thinking of those brilliant scientists. What I'm going to offer is very simple mathematical tools that are being used now and will eventually, I believe, improve uh, a lot of the procedures conducted in the empirical science. So let me go to the first one. Why do I say that position is at the heart of human cognition and ethics? And I'd like to prove it to you by going back to Adam and Eve. The first question that uh, Adam is asked to answer is, uh, hey, did you eat from this uh, tree that I told you not to eat? <laughs> and what did Adam answer? He said, she. She handed me the fruit and I ate. Okay. So God did not ask for explanation. God asked for the fact. Did you eat? Did you or did you? And Adam finds uh, the reason to, to either apologize or to excuse himself and say, she, passing the back, back into my aim is as proficient in causal argumentation. And she said, me? The serpent deceived me and I ate. Even in the Garden of Eden, you had no reason <laughs> to excuse yourself. You already had this understanding of that there are causes in effect in the world, and you identified the cause for your deeds. But then I said it, it's a basis <clears throat> of also a sense of justice. And here I go to the first time in the Bible where I find counterfactuals. And the first time that I found it, it was in Abraham. I mean, God was planning to destroy the two wicked cities, Sodom and Abraham. Um, Abraham stopped him and said, hey, you can't do that. Are you about to smite the righteous with the wicked? If you want to hear how it sounded in Hebrew, then, Ha'im tispet tzaddik im rasha. Hagam tispet tzaddik. Ha'af tispet tzaddik im rasha. That's how it sounded there 3,000 years ago. And 
what if there were 50 righteous men in the city? Now here you have the counterfactual. What if, I mean, God knows how to count. <laughs> so what, is it? what if? Does Abraham doubt God's ability to count? Or God's ability to distinguish between the wicked and the righteous? Well, this is what uh, God answered him. If I find in the city, here, here you have God speak. God who knows who is wicked and who is righteous, and he gives him the counterfactual. If I find okay, the, uh, in the city of Sodom 50 good men, I will pardon the whole place for their sake. And you think Abraham gave up? Mm, what about for his wife? <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, he said. I even make a big fuss about five. And God says, no, four or five is fine for me. So Abraham, oh, sorry, Abraham goes back to um, 40, to 30, to 20, to 10, and you know the end. And the question that I ask you is what Abraham is trying to figure out. Why well, hasn't been haggled about these numbers when we assume that God is all knowing? And um, there is, either there is, or there are enough righteous people to justify the destruction of the city. Well, the only explanation I can give you here is to say that God, Abraham was looking for a generic rule for collective punishment. Under what condition would it be justified to punish an entire community on account of you? So Abraham was not concerned only with these two particular cities, but in the general rule for all cities in the future, Abraham was looking for a generic rule, and in that sense, Abraham was the first scientist that I made in the Bible. <laughs> because the nature of, the, of science is to figure out the generic rule of physics, of, of nature, of biology, or whatever topic you are. <clears throat> So that's why I have this box there which says scientific thinking. And now I want to convince you that science is all about counterfactual. We didn't learn counterfactual in high school. We learned physics in high school, but not counterfactual in our time. Well, here's, in, here's my proof. It doesn't take more than two minutes to convince you that. <clears throat> you look at Hooke's law. It says that the, the length of the spring is equal to some constant, I'll take it two, times the weight that you hang on it. So here, for instance, the length is equal to twice the weight. And the weight happened to be one kilogram. Fine. So this is what I, I, I express this particular spring with the constant two. Here's the solution. X equal to one and Y is equal to two. And one can solve it. And the question is, <coughs> Uh, is this set of equations equivalent to that? According to my book of algebra, two sets of equations are algebraically equivalent if they preserve solution. If it's solution to one set, it's identical to the solution for another set. In this case, they're identical. So you might say they are equivalent. However, every one of you feels that there's some more information here than the other. Here's another set okay, of equations having the same solution, x equal to 1 and y is equal to 2. Are they equivalent? Well, what is that information that you find in the left set that you could not find here? I claim, by maturity, that if I were to ask you this question, had x been 3, had the weight been not 1 kilogram, but 3 kilograms, why would be six? I can figure it out from here. Uh, I cannot figure it out from here. No, I can from here. Which means that there is something special about this equation, despite the fact that it's algebraically equivalent here, that convey process information that um, is sort of get missed if you if you treat those equations as algebraic. They're not algebraic. All the equations that you learn in physics high school 
were counterfactually based because they allowed you to solve this kind of problem. Of how? You take a new boundary condition. Previously the weight was one, now it's three. I'll strike out the equation for one, I substitute in another equation, and I solve a new set of equations. That's every child does it in his head when you are solving physics high school. A uh, robot must do it in his head when the robot is giving a problem of that nature. <clears throat> but in, in order to do that, the robot must be equipped with an algebra, a component of which is striking out equation and replacing it by another equation. Here it's very easy. I know what to strike out and what to substitute. If I strike out x here, and I substitute by x in 3, you say, no, it doesn't give you the right solution. So there's something special about the format of those equations that gives you the right information. What is it, something? It's, uh, it's really a sign. It says that nature <coughs> assigns a value to the spring. Why? According to consultation with the weight that you hang on it. And it goes through some process, multiplied by two in this case, very simple. That could be a complex process. And that going through this computation, nature comes to the conclusion that the spring deserves a length of two. That is the scientific conception of science, okay? conception of physics. And the correct notation for that will be either a sine symbol or an arrow brings us to graphs in a natural way. And um, that is the whole story that I want to tell. Because I'm going to take it now and assume that the whole nature is full of spring. Oh, not yet. Okay. First I'm going to take what's the relation to robotics. I justified already scientific thinking. I'm going to justify robotics. This robot is not different than the economics, econ econometrician who look at the economy, it's all messy, it's all noisy, and has to figure out how to fix it. <laughs> yes. A previous one? Okay. Being here. Yeah. Well, that, that's the whole point. What gives us the ingenuity? To answer this question by striking out x and not y, you see here it says here, had x been 3, you give a counterfactual, and that the symbol of the counterfactual relates to x. So you want to change the equation that determines x. Right? If you were messing up the, equa the equations in such a form that you don't know who determines x, any one of the equations will determine x. Here it's very clear. So unless you have this information encoded in, these are not just algebraic equations. These are algebraic equations together with an identity of the determinant. That's why I choose that one and not that one. And now we go to robotics and we were facing here. So you say, okay, <clears throat> why don't we teach the robot? What causes work in the kitchen and the laboratory? And once the robot takes all the rules, it was that, it was that, the robot can just follow the rules and give you the right answer. Because even in a simple case, you find out that you get outrageously ridiculous answer. Here are two rules. If the glass is wet, then it rains. If I break this button, the glass will get wet. And the robot chain the two together. Two rules, two logic. He says, if we break this button, then it rains. Let's put the two together, right? Right, Tori? <laughs> so you don't want it. You don't, you don't want just a stupid answer like this. You want the robot to, to reason and say, no, no, no. There's an exception here. So it's not simple to, to uh, the algebra of causation is not as simple as you find in classical logic. And now let's go to <clears throat> and ask ourselves what kind of question we want the robot to answer, and I classify them into three layers in a hierarchy, which require a different treatment. One is, 
observation. <clears throat> what if I see? Next one, what if I do? And the third one, what if uh, we did things differently? Let the come to fact. And we have a name for that. Ah, we, we can decorate it with probability. How likely it is if I do? But that's the second level, the probability. Now, they have a name. What if? What if? And why? And it also happens that sentences in each one of the layers here have syntactic signature. We can tell, if you do the, the mathematics correctly, you can tell what layer it belongs to. So you can tell them apart. And it's also the case that you cannot get any conclusion in any layer unless you have assumptions in the layer below it or higher. So to get conclusions about actions, you have to have assumptions about actions or assumptions about the of action. You cannot get it just by seeing. You cannot see the passionately and answer questions about actions. That's nice. You have hierarchy. You can trace the assumption and see what is needed. That's the cause of hierarchy. Now I'm coming to the final one. The, the scientific application, which I'm going to spend the next of the uh, lecture. And um, <clears throat> I show you in what areas of application all this comes. Uh, first, it's based on a methodology that is necessary for anyone who is doing causal influence. Some of them it looks ridiculously obvious. Like, define your question. What are you trying to find? Believe me, if you were to review as many papers as I did in the last year, you would not. 90% of the authors do not define the question. So we did this, we did this, we did this, we did this, and you have what was your problem? You don't find it. Why? It's not easy to articulate. You think it's easy, but when you have no mathematics to articulate it, you shy away from articulating it. Then you just tell the readers what you did. I did simulation here. <laughs> Here's an example. Suppose I want to find the probability of outcome given that I raise tax. I do X, put the tax at 5% more than it is today. In order to articulate it, you need to have a mathematics that has a do operator in it. You cannot replace it by um, observational, like a, a regression coefficient, or conditional probability. So I'll give you the typical queries that come up in empirical science. That people would like to know about. And the, only recently, we have, they have the mathematics of articulating. Here's another one. I want the cause and effect of doing x versus doing x zero. What is the difference in expected value? Or <clears throat> suppose I do x as a result of observing z. So if I find that the unemployment goes below 5%, I raise the tax. If it is not below, I do something else. It's conditional action. Okay? You write, write it like that, like that way. Okay? part of defining the question. Or, for instance, I <clears throat> have a sequence of action, a plan. I do X, and I do Z, and I do W. Or, if I want to find the probability, or the expected value of the probability, that the outcome will take a certain value. Ah, on the treated. Suppose you have experiments, and some people were treated, and some were uh, cured and some were not cured, and you want to find the what on this particular collective that were treated. You want to find out how they would behave if they were not treated. So you see here x and you have x prime. On those that had x prime, what if they had x? That's the counterfactual. More sophisticated. I'll go to that later. Here's the direct effect, and you want to find what would be the outcome <coughs> if the treatment was X, 
And some other variable will say in the variable that it would have had, had x been different, x by You see how complicated and convoluted things get. But once we have an algebra to express them, they can be so nicely and parsimoniously be expressed. So you, you have the freedom now of confessing to the reader what your research is all about. And believe me, this is 95% of the confusion. What you are about to, what is your question, your research question? Now, <clears throat> the next one, you have to assume something, because we have a hierarchy. You cannot get conclusion about policy if you don't make assumptions about them. So what are your causal assumptions? You have to express it in some language. The language of statistics is insufficient. And today we have a language of graph that can express it and encode them in both friendly and accurate and formal way. I'll demonstrate some of that. I'll skip that. I'll skip that. Now, here's the world full of spring. How do we do that? We imagine the world is full of springs, that means functions. Every variable has a value. The temperature has a value of 20 degrees centigrade for this object. Because something happens in the environment. This object is listening, keyword, listening to other variables, maybe the radiation of this light bulb, so on, and attains the value. Really, nature does it. Nature looks at all the variables around it, goes to some computation, and determines the value of the temperature of this object. So here you have every variable, di, takes on a value which is a function of the other variables from two classes. Some of them are exogenous. Those whose explanation we don't care about. The weather, war and peace, the price of beans in China. And, and those that are explained within the mind. So now if we have a collection of functions, we can define things properly. And here is a definition. It's a typical equation in, in economics. If those of you took economic 101. Now, <clears throat> this brings us to the a slide after which I can go home, because everything is encapsulated in that slide. Define counterfactual, given that you have a collection of functions. I want to define what I mean by why would be small y in situation u had x been x. I need to define it mathematically. Once I have it defined mathematically, I let this math math mathematician take over. I can go home. So here it is by definition. It is solution for y in a mutilated model, m sub x, where the equations for x was replaced by a constant. That's exactly what we had with the spring view. We took the x equal to 3, we replaced it with x equal to uh -huh. are, x is equal to 3, and <clears throat> the counterfactual will be true if the solution for capital Y is equal to small y. I have a definition. The truth value. Now Everything is open. I just write it down in, in the form of a in condensed form. The counterfactual y sub x is equal to the solution. Everybody knows how to solve the equation. I solve algebra. Why? In but but you solve it in a mutilated model which you truncate or you purge from one equation, the one that mentioned by the antecedent, replaced by constant and solving. So now we have a Mathematical definition for a counterfactual. Counterfactual, you no, know, is a, is a man, controversial uh, concept. Some of my best friends argue that counterfactual don't exist. It's medical. It's a metaphysical. It's only uh, a threat for common sense and so forth. So it is controversial. But now I put a mathematical. It is into a mathematics. So even if it's a controversial, at least you get a result that tells you what the world will be like if there was a counterfactual, and if my picture of nature is as I described it. That Mother Nature looks at everything in it does. So that I can, at this point, I can just quit and tell you, as they say in Hebrew, the dach zilgmor, which means the rest you can study by yourself. <laughs> Uh, but I will not be that crude. 
<coughs> instead I will walk you through some of the exercises <coughs> that follow from it. For instance, <coughs> I, I can now define joint probability of the upcoming structure. For every four sets, x, y, z, and w, I can define what it means, the probability, the y would take on small, a small y. Had x been small x, in some intensity, z would take on a small z, had w been small. Right? It follows from the definition. Chick shot. Next one. Effect of action, I can define. Attribution, for instance, what's the probability that the guy will be alive had he not taken drug, given that in fact he's dead and he did, did take drug. <laughs> that's that's counterfactual. The guy is dead. <coughs> but I can figure, I can write it down. I didn't say figure out. I just said I write a mathematical formula for my research question. And that is 95% of solving. Because we have now semantic. Once you have semantic, then you have, oh, once you have semantic, then you can go to the computational phase and ask the question of, can I estimate it from data? What is the algorithm? How do I uh, divide an algorithm to do it fast and so on? But semantic is the basis. So <clears throat> let me go through and tell you the miracle of universal constraints, because that is a key and looking back at my work from 1980. This is the key for the relationship between causality and probability. I call it pluribus unum, because pluribus unum stands for out of many comes one. In many phenomena in science, you have this strange phenomena that the complexity of the thing make the result simple. <laughs> when you have many components interacting, sometimes you get uh, obvious results that you cannot, um, that is surprising. For instance, the law of large number is one thing. The more samples you take, the closer you are to the average. That was proven by Bernoulli in 1710. If you look out from the channel, or take the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the bell curve. What did they call? Huh? It's the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem. That the more variables you combine additively together um, and they are independent, the closer you come to the Gaussian bell shape. Out of chaos comes something very nice, a bell shape. So human height is distributed by a bell shape. And human income, a bell shape, and so on and so on. And there's no relation between them, and you see the unity. Huh? Just because they are complex. I would like to embed now the desaturation in that context. Here we have a, a miracle of science then despite complexity, you get something which is simple. And it goes like this. Assuming that you have here the same story about the sprinkler and the climate. Okay? And assuming that nature will be really behave the way I told you before, that every variable here takes a value which is a function of some other variables in the domain. For instance, uh, sprinkling, whether you turn it on or off, depends on the climate and some noise you subject. So you have a collection of functions. Now, here's the mirror. And we, we also remember that each process, like from C to S, can be a summary of millions of microprocessors. that we didn't bother to put down the microscopic processes. We, we only take ma macroscopic variables that we can measure, like the season, with the spring and so So we imagine that every link here in the graph represents millions of microprocessors, and they can have feedback in them. They can have their big being bombarded by noises from cosmic radiation, whatever you want. 
And now here comes a miracle. Zoop! No matter how complex these functions are, and no matter how they use are distributed, if they are independent, then they observe distribution. That's the gift that nature gives you, something to observe, a statistic. Must satisfy a certain constraint. And here they are. Okay. Here are the invariant. There are constraints which are independent on the nature of the functions and the nature of the distributions of the noises. And they can be read from the structure of the original graph. You don't have to form a new graph to figure out what's invariant. So the invariants are given to you by the structure of the graph. What are they? If some of you know this information, I'm just demonstrating it. Here it is. It says every missing value, every missing error, advertises an independency conditional on a separating set. Here I have a missing link between climate and weather. It tells me that in the distribution that you find, in the statistics, if you go to neighborhoods and you measure the pavements all around, you will find that the climate is going to be independent on the wetness given S and R, sprinkler status and rain status. These are the separate. They separate that node from that node. Because you cannot go from here to here unless you go through them. We call them separate. And the same thing goes for that. Here's another missing link, SR. Here's a separator. So these are conditional independencies you can see in your distribution. And they give you the hint, the clue, onto the source, into nature, the, the process, the data generating process that brought about the data. So this is uh, the mirror. I never presented it that way. I only realized in the past, I think, you know, six weeks, that I can present it that way because it is the basis of everything else that follows. Why is it important? One, because structure, suppose you, you want to learn the structure of nature. How <coughs> treatment, how aspirin affects your health? Is it because it affects your vascular? Uh, system or that's something to your, your nervous system. So you want to find out the, the mapping behind, uh, the role map behind the activity of nature. It's given to you partially by the signature of this separation, by that in, these are independent. Second, if you have a model and you want to test it, these provide you the, tested, the test, uh, testable implication. Without which you cannot test your mind. Third, it allows you to reduce what if I do question to symbolic calculus, which I'm going to show you. And fourth, it reduces many scientific questions, not only of what if I do nature, to symbolic calculus. And this is what I'm going to show you. So here we are <coughs> facing seeing versus doing. What the, how did the robot know? to answer differently to the question, what if I see the sprinkler on, and what if I turn the sprinkler on? Well, the robot did the following trick. <clears throat> the robot eliminated the equation that previously determined the value of the sprinkler, it was a season, and solved new set of equations in this mutualism graph. Now the answer is given to you here, and that uh, symbol stands for inequality, turning the sprinkler on is not the same as seeing the sprinkler If I see the sprinkler on, I can figure out that the season is right. If I turn it on, it tells me nothing about the season. Don't go backwards. So, that's one element, and that leads to do calculus. It's a calculus, I don't want you to figure out the equation, but I give you the flavor. It allows you to take a sentence which has a do operator in it and a C operator. That's Z, something that you, so you condition on, and derive from it other sentences of this nature. If some certain conditions hold it together. 
Why is it useful? Because I can take it and reduce hard questions about policy to symbolic calculus, as this is so equation. For instance, in concreteness means it will not do better. Okay. Suppose you want you think out what if I smoke? You get up one morning with a good mood, what if I smoke? And you know that uh, the danger of cancer. You know that however there is uh, some compounders, it could be a genotype that takes people crazy to nicotine, sometimes put them into a cancer risk. Okay? So this is your structure, is your understanding of nature. And the relationship between smoking and cancer goes through tar accumulation in the lung. And suppose you take only measurement of smoking, tar, and cancer, not on genotype, but unobserved. Can you figure out the probability of cancer if you smoke? If you smoke means not if you happen to smoke, but if you decide to smoke. If you force someone to smoke. And so you see what we do. We start with a query. Find the probability of cancer. Yeah. If you do smoke, take somebody and you force him to smoke three packs a day. <coughs> From what? From observation of data. I have only the probability of S, T, and cancer, not of L. I go and I grind, I grind, I grind, I grind, I grind, I grind, zoop, look what I did. I eliminated the do. That means that I can figure out what will happen if I do something? By passive observation. White. White formula. All these are, can be inferred from passive observation on observation from observational studies. Just, they're just um, regression expressions. Just to give you the flavor of what you can do with the calculus. It's a powerful thing, calculus. You know, when you think about liveness, finding up maximum and minimum, doing derivatives. He probably jumped from his chair and he said, hey, I can figure out, you know, with the curve, with the brachistochrona or whatever, with the minimum speed, maximum speed. It was a, a splash in the, in the 18th century. You can figure out maximum and minimum by sitting on your table, you know, <laughs> Moving symbols from one side of the equation to the other. I'm surprised that uh, we didn't have a festival. <laughs> well, I had this festival and I saw that. Gee, you don't do experiments. You just sit there and you figure out what would, do, what would be the result if you do experiment. <clears throat> Another example. Effect of warm-up in sport. If you take it from sport medicine. You want to figure out if warm-up Contributes to injury or minimizes injury. There are many factors that go there. Team motivation, aggression, the type of coach you have, fitness levels. I don't even know how to pronounce it, neuromuscular, but that was given to me by uh, Shri and Vlad, who are dealing with sports medicine. And you want to figure out from data. You look at the games played and the injuries and the amount of warm-up exercise before that, you want to figure out some data. You have a graph, you have that, do calculus, grind through, and now we, have, we can do better than do calculus. The do calculus is like deriving things, like solving an integral. You're not going to get the right results. Now we have a <coughs> graphical criteria. You give me the graph, and I can tell you yes or no, and I can tell you what to do. For instance, if you adjust for this two, you are done, and you get the right result. For instance, you can adjust for only these two, and it's enough. For instance, thou shall not adjust for previous injuries. Because if a collider, it will create spurious correlations. So that gives you the flavor of what we can do today with the mathematics, both the combination of algebra, the two calculus, and the graph. No thinking. Just grinding through it, single. OK, now, next one. Talking about the second victory of counterfactual, and this has to do with attribution. Find out the blame. Your Honor, my client, Mr. A, died because he used a drug. Now, according to the lawmakers, 
the family of the deceased should get compensation if and only if it is more probable than not that Mr. A would be alive but for the drug. This is an expression used by lawyers, not by my mathematician. But for. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am full of respect for the legal profession. Because as far back as Hammurabi, lawyers had to encode social relationship, you know, cognitive relationship into a code that people can communicate. And I think people would come to a sort of consensus with the AI at the time. And that's what they came up with, you see. More probable than not, greater than 50 percent, of what? That he would be alive but for the drug. If they use the time to Now, what do you put him? The A is dead, he took a drug and he wanted to be probably to greater than 50 percent, but what do you put here? You cannot put there that he is alive. So he's actually dead. So what do we put here? You have to put in the counterfactual. Are we scared of counterfactual? High school algebra. Solving equation. So we shouldn't get scared. Okay, now that we are not scared, look. We go to the solution. Yeah, yeah yes. <clears throat> we define a quality, Pn, probability of necessary cause, and um, you see the expression, we can write it. Writing is 90% of the solution. Now we can ask, is it computable from a model? Yes, we know how to compute counterfactual if you had the model. Admittedly, we don't have the model. We don't have the functions, we don't have the probability on the noises. However, can we infer it from data? Here's the second. Under what condition can we infer it from data? And the answer is, we have bounds, and sometimes we have identification, in the case of Mr. A, if the lawyers bring here two kinds of data, experimental and non-experimental, okay, we plug them into the inequality before, and look what we have You are guilty. With what? With probability one. Why? Because I crafted the two tables in such a way that I'll get the probability one. And in such a way that you wouldn't be able to tell this probability one by just looking at the table. It's a miracle of symbolic calculus that you get a surprise, surprising answer which is correct, despite the fact that by their eye the tables look innocent. There's nothing there to say that the guy is guilty or not. So they are. The probability one. Some statistician want to eat me alive because I think you can figure out the probability why if a single person is guilty or a single person would have been alive. It's unheard of. But that we mean that people in this in the Mr. A category with a probability of 100 percent in this subcategory that they would be um, <clears throat> would be dead. They would be alive. Okay. Next victory. Mediation. We would like to know how nature works. And we sometimes the law requires us to distinguish between direct effects and indirect effects. We send people to the electric chair because they're directly responsible for the death of somebody. And we pardon them if they are only indirect effects. So it, it, it is a great issue. It's not just a you know, a mathematical gimmick. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, I'll explain that. No? So here's the problem. I want to, to define what I mean by the indirect effect of X and Y. But I have unknown nonlinear function connecting X and Z and Y. Here they are. There's nothing that I can do by controlling variables that will disable the link between x and y and so that whatever I measure can be attributed to the indirect effect through z. I cannot fix any variables to make sure that that link is disabled. Disabling a link is not doable by fixing variables. So we have to think to define counterfact uh, indirect effect counterfactual. 
What is the indirect effect of X and Y closely? It is the expected change in Y when we keep X constant, but we change, we let Z change to whatever value it would have attained had X changed from X0 to X1. So we think doubly counterfactual. It's a nested counterfactual. We keep X constant and we imagine that Z increases from whatever value it has now to the value it would have attained as if X changed. Are we scared of that? No. Because even nested counterfactual can be computed if you have the correct model. If you don't have model, you ask yourself under what condition we can iterate some data. And that's what we did here. So, here is the policy implication of that indirect. It's not just a metaphysics. Suppose we want to talk about the effect of uh, gender on hiring. And we know that the employer hire people if they have no um, bias against gender, they hire them according to qualifications. And we want to know what will be the gender mix in the population. If we convince people not to discriminate at the time of hire, to look only at qualifications, not on at the gender. That's a policy question. But here you have a new kind of intervention. Intervention is you educate people not to uh, discriminate, as opposed to fixing some value. It's a new kind of uh, intervention. Okay? It turns out it, it's solvable, and the answer is, I'll show it to you. Oh. Answer is some equation theory because we can articulate the condition under which it will be inferred, estimable for data, both empirical and observational. And then we have a estimate. It means that the expression in terms of the joint probability, that if the assumptions are correct, will give you either the indirect effect, which is given, which is defined as the fraction of responses explained by mediation versus a fraction of responses ordered to mediation. The two are not the same in non-linear systems. How am I doing on time? Ten minutes, terrific. Now I'm coming to the uh, latest part, which is, I'm very proud of. And I must confess, because it has to do with a problem that is lingering, is lingering in the period of science for many decades, and many decades as the literature goes. But it has a problem of transportability. You conduct the experiment in the laboratory, and you wonder whether it is applicable to the field outside the laboratory. You conduct the experiment on monkey, you want to know if it is applicable to human beings. You conduct experiment on rat, or robots is being trained in a certain environment, and then you send the robots to Mars. And you want to know if they, whatever was learned in this experiment, the environment, is applicable to another environment. And it, it, it pervades, pervades in all the empirical of science, generalizability. And uh, here we okay. oh, we also can talk about statistical sort of let, let me quit that. Observation from observation to observation. Let's talk here about transportability, which has to do with experiment. To an environment we cannot conduct experiments. All you see is passive observation. Here's an example. You conduct experiment in Los Angeles. You do intervention. You spend a million and a half dollars of your grant on randomized experiment on the drug and look at the outcome. Then you go to New York City. Your grant has no more money. All you can do is pick up the telephone and call people and say, have you used the drug? What's the outcome? And uh, so you cannot conduct experiment in New York City, but you want some of the results that you've taken in Los Angeles to be useful to you in, in New York. How can you transfer from here to here? The two environments are different for two reasons. First, that one was experimental, and that one is observation. And second one, 
The population of New York City is different than the population of Los Angeles. Why? There can be an age difference. See the age over there? You can measure age. They can vary to different uh, environments. Los Angeles has a young husky people, and New York has all the age So how can you generalize? Um, what we need is the probability of the outcome, given that we apply this treatment in New York City, P star, what is it? What, what we can learn from the fact? Well, it turns out it's very easy. Yeah? If you assume that age is the only factor that changes and everything else is the main thing, then you can um, recalibrate. You look at the effect of the drug on every age group separately. And then you weigh them different. You calibrate it by the probability in New York City that the person will have will be in a certain age group. Recalibration is easy. But you can have more complex situations. Here if Z represents age, then we have a recalibration. What about if Z represents language skills? New York City Board of Education is more enlightened than that of Los Angeles. And they have, a, um, assuming that they have a new, they teach children to read at the earlier age. So the Z now represents language skill, and uh, it's different than Los Angeles. Would you say that they have to recalibrate? The answer is no, because language skill has no effect on outcome, on the recovery, and things like that. So the answer is intuitive. Answer is no. No calibration is needed. What about if Z stands for something else? Z stands for a biomarker that stands between X and Y. Does it require a new uh, formula? Turns out yes. Here we are facing a situation that every story demands a new calibration formula. Can we get the rule? Like Abraham, what is the rule? You give me the story, I'll give you the right way of combining data. In the two locations. So this is what we want. You give me a complex map and tell me only where you suspect the differences are between the two populations. I suspect here, I suspect here. The input is annotated graph with the factors that have the potential of creating differences. You don't know quantitatively what the differences are. You just suspect. The output, what the expected output, the demand from yourself and from the calculator would be first a yes or no answer. Is it transportable or not? Then can I estimate bias free my desired quantity? The cause effect of X or Y in New York City. If no, be honest. Tell me no, I wouldn't spend much time. It says hours of work. Then tell me what measurement do I need to take in each study? in New York and Los Angeles, and then tell me how to combine them. So this is a combination rule. And the answer is, yes, we have a theorem. That <coughs> transportability can be reduced to calculus. You don't have to think. That's the whole idea about computer science. Science of people, right? Yes. We want a computer to do the arithmetic. We want a computer to do that and that and that. And now we want a computer to do a task that generation after generations of empirical scientists could not even begin to address. I'm not talking about so. Even to articulate it. Reduce to calculus. If you can turn the crank and apply the rules of two calculus in such a way that the S variable, the factor, can be separated from the do, we are done. Here I'll show you how it can be done, but it's too, too detailed. Here's the answer. The answer is yes, we can do it. Uh, we can get a transport formula. And look what it contains. It contains two types of expression. Things that you can measure in your city, these are the pink ones. Things that you should measure in Los Angeles. And this is how you should combine them to get a bias-free estimation of your target formula. The answer to your research question.
So any graph is an answer. I can go on and on, but maybe I shouldn't bother you, I shouldn't um, tire you with additional marvels of that uh, theory of transportability. Just give you the last thing. And it is going to be like that here. <clears throat> At the blue sky. We want to find the cause effect of a treatment on outcome in Arkansas. I like this, the way it sounds. <laughs> but I never been there. <laughs> yeah. But we have an idea that these are the causal connection among the variables. And here we have studies conducted in uh, eight other cities in the United States. Some of them are observational. You can see here. Some of them are experimental. They, are, they have no link between the, uh, going into the tree. So they are experimental. And they differ from each other. Look, they have an S variable. They are the factor that makes one population different than the Arkansas population. Here the H can be different. Here the W can be different. Okay. S presents the threat of disparity. How do I combine the data that I take from these eight cities to find out the cause of trade potential Y in Arkansas? That is the question, and it can be solved. Not in its entirety, almost entirety, it goes like that. I take what's common and I combine the data, but only for what is common between the um, studies. What is common between these two for you? Oh, let me take here. Uh, let me go. The last one is even nicer. Here. This is Arkansas, and here are four studies. Okay. I looked at them and I. Now I'm telling you something which is derived from my experience. I can look at the graph and tell you if we can express a certain information, a certain cause information. You probably do not do it yet, but I can assure you that in five years, everyone will be able to do it uh, in statistics, in education. Okay? So if you take statistics one on one, you should be able to look at the graph and tell you what kind of cause information you can extract. So I can tell you, for instance, that from here, we can extract the cause of effect of x and y. So here it is. From g, from operation g, we can put the cause of effect of x on y. Do x, y. Okay? I can do also do it from here. If I do a certain calibration. Which means that I can get the same quantity, the effect of x and y, from two different studies. One of them is experimental, one of them is observation, but who cares? I don't want to waste, however, samples, because samples are scarce. People pay them very dearly. So I want to combine as many samples as I have. So I'm combining samples from here and here. So I pull the sample, and I get more reliable estimates of what I do. I'm going to write it up even more so. <clears throat> I can do even better than that. Why? Because I don't want to waste samples in these two, in these two studies. I want to milk it as much as possible for the information that can give. So I go through an intermediate exercise. I pull information from that and that. I notice that I can do some tricks here in my composition. I get an, uh, a, a quantity which is identical to the one. Now I combine it zoop, and I get the answer. Utilizing all the samples from the entire, from the four cities. Eventually, what we I envision is to have uh, big data. Well, we have data available from every hospital in North America. I don't want to say United States. I don't want to discriminate against Canadians <coughs> in North America. And the patient comes and says, should I take this uh, surgery or not? I'm Arkansas. I want the answer to be tailored to me, to people like me. And I want the computer to grind through a hundred or thousands of hospitals and come up and say the cause and effect of this surgery on people like you is additive. Go ahead. This is a dream. Okay. Conclusion, counterfactual of a billion lots of three things. Scientific thought, free will, 
אל בור אל מאיר. אין ספק. דעה גירוש מזה יש נפקן בצד שלו, שאני שואל את זה די. אז בנפיקת סרוול פרובלמס, אלא אם דמחים את הסייט. ‫אינקלודים פלסטי ואריאשן, ‫מדיאשן מוטיב, ‫זה לא יודע, ‫אינקלודים פלסטי ואריאשן. ‫אז האפורט שאנחנו מנסים ‫בניסיון להקריב רובוט ‫עם קוזה אפקט, ‫קלקולוס, ‫פייד אוף בטוטלי דיפרנט אנבייט, ‫עם פיפל שיכולים לעשות את זה ‫עד היום. ‫וזה מביא אותנו ‫לסטפ קלוס על אצ'יבים, ‫קואופרטיב בהיבר ‫בין קומפיוטרס ואומנים, ‫בגלל שאנחנו רוצים את הקומפיוטרס ‫לקומיוניקט. In our language, and a great part of our language is written and laden with causal relationships. And the final conclusion would be with understanding you, and it's very fun. <coughs> but fun, but it's fun is seeing your intuition amplified through the microscope of formal analysis. And what is great, even greater fun. is to watch with amazement how you can do things today that you couldn't yesterday. Thank you.